what I begin to begin to do is I begin to surround myself with people with those same intentions, those same ideas. I begin to educate myself a little bit more on the things that they do and what it took for them to get there, which was academics. Uh, it was a lot of sacrifice as far as sometimes having to work out and go run and uh, miss events that you may have been able to go to to uh, be able to attain a certain goal. And so with that intention, I am still today in that, uh, you know, in alignment with the things I decided that I wanted to do 10 years old that led to, you know, Harlem Globe Trotting, that led to coaching, kids clinics, speaking in front of people. And that, that's that been my intentions ever since I was 10 years old and it's continued, it hasn't changed very much. This is Intentionally Ever After. Join Intentional Lifestyle Coach Joe Bukartek for a series of personal conversations and coaching sessions with various people about how living with intention shows up for them. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Intentionally Ever After. Today, I have the great delight and privilege of speaking with Mr. Herb Lang. Herb, welcome. Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate you having me on your show, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Much gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Herb, will you kindly introduce yourself to folks? Well, uh, my name is Herb Lang. I am a uh, small town guy from from Arkansas. I grew up with a uh, young mother. Mother had me at the age of 16. By the time she was 25, there were six of us. And uh, I mean, we never had a lot growing up, we had pretty much had everything that we needed. And growing up the way that I did taught me a lot of gratitude and made me a lot of who I am today. Um, eventually, you know, from growing up in the small small town of Arkansas, I ended up with a basketball scholarship to the smallest Division One school in the nation, which is Centenary College, located in Shreveport, Louisiana, where I went to have a pretty good uh, basketball career, winning the uh, NCAA College Slam Dunk Contest back in 1998, which this is the 25th anniversary which is pretty cool of me winning the dunk contest on ESPN back then. And that which uh, kind of led me to my uh, Harlem Globetrotter career. Um, I played for the Harlem Globetrotters as a player coach as Flight Time. And as Flight Time, her Flight Time Lang with the Globetrotters, a lot of people may remember me from my three seasons on CBS's The Amazing Race with my good friend and former teammate and partner, Big Easy, Lofton, who uh, played a few years after me. But I mean, it was uh, a great run that we had. And since retiring from the Globe Charters in 2017, I've gone on to become a motivational speaker. Um, I've had a chance to uh, do some acting um, and just uh, had a chance to sell insurance. I mean, you name it, I've experimented and tried a few different things out, just trying to figure out exactly what this journey is. And I know for the most part of it is spreading kindness in the way that I did those 18 years traveling to uh, uh, almost 90 different countries around the world as a Globe Charter. Wow. Wow, you just uh I wasn't wasn't totally tracking the number, but you you listed at least three or four people's life's experiences in that bio easily. <laughs> what a what a fascinating, fascinating life. Um thank you again for for being on to to share your perspectives here. Um I'm very, very excited to be talking to you. What I'd like to do, Herb, is to kind of do a rapid fire in the beginning here, get some very brief uh, responses to these questions. And then afterwards, dig a little bit deeper if you're okay with that. I'm okay with it. Thanks again, man. I appreciate you having me on your show. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's begin. Herb, what does it mean to live intentionally? Well, for me to live intentionally means to, uh, kind of have a, in your mindset, a purpose, like for example, myself, uh, growing up, it was probably around the age of, I'd say 10 years old that I knew that I wanted to become involved in sports. I knew that I wanted to become uh, an athlete or play a sport or just somehow become involved in it. So what I began to begin to do is I began to surround myself with people with those same intentions, those same ideas. I began to educate myself a little bit more on the things that they do and what it took for them to get there, which was academics. Uh, it was a lot of sacrifice as far as sometimes having to work out and go run and uh, miss events that you may have been able to go to, to uh, be able to attain a certain goal. And so with that intention, I am still today in that, uh, you know, in alignment with the things I decided that I wanted to do 10 years old that led to, you know, Harlem Globetrotting, that led to coaching, kids clinics, speaking in front of people. 
And that, that's been my intentions ever since I was 10 years old. And it's continuing. It hasn't changed very much, uh, even right now at 46 years old. There you go. Herb, that, first of all, you are the worst at rapid fire. I got to be honest with you. That was a great answer. But I'm going to ask you much more about all of that as we okay. move on. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's do it. What is one change in habit that has had an exponential payoff? I would say uh, one change in habit since I moved to uh, to California six years ago from Louisiana, I'd have to say my eating habits. Uh, I've become a little bit more conscious. That's great. I'm I'm so going to ask you about that. What have you said no to that has made a significant impact in your life? Well, certainly early on as a child, I would say not a child, but a teenager, it would be uh, alcohol and drugs. Beautiful. What area in your life feels just about perfect? To be honest with you, Joe, nothing seems to be absolutely perfect because I'm always striving for that perfection. So therefore, I'm never really satisfied. Ooh, I love that. Who is someone you admire and what do you admire about them? I admire my wife. Um, I've been married for about a year now and I just admire the way that she gets up and I mean, she works out, she runs her businesses in a professional way. And, uh, you know, being married now for over a year and being together six years, I definitely admire and she inspires me. Who is someone you admire and what do you admire about them? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just reread that question. Sorry. Herb. All right, we'll move here. What do you imagine some people admire about you? Well, for me, I think that some people pro that know me, they probably admire my determination and my willingness to never give up on my dreams. So good. So good. All right. Thank you for playing along to the rapid fire portion of this. Oh, that was it? Good sport. That was it for was rapid it? fire. Yeah. Right, I'm... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, now, now we're going to go back in, right? And now, you know, the the gloves are off, the brakes are off. We're gonna we're gonna get get deeper into this. So let's do it. Back to that first one, please. Of living intentionally, right? You, the key word you mentioned right off the bat was purpose, right? And you knew early on you you connected with the idea of sports. You wanted to be into that. Can you please take us a little deeper into what does it mean to live intentionally? Well, I mean, again, to live intentionally is to have, you know, a mindset that has a purpose, you know, ends with a purpose. And so for me, again, beginning back at the age of 10 years old and really getting into seventh grade and playing organized sports for the first time was when I really, really, really realized uh, the impact that sports could have on my life and the impact that I could have on others' life if I used the gifts that I had, you know, in a proper way. So uh, again, early on, seventh grade, I, that's when I met my high school basketball coach, who was a phys ed major. And he was a person that took me under his wings and kind of molded me into the person that I eventually became in preparation for college and, you know, instilling in me the importance of education. And so, I mean, just like him, I ended up, you know, getting my degree, college degree in health and physical education. And so, with people like that behind me and surrounding myself with a group of friends who also wanted, you know, some of the same things that I did. We were able to graduate high school with honors. Uh, five of us were able to get athletic scholarships, you know, which was important because a lot of us come from backgrounds that, you know, didn't have the the means to finance and finances to uh, pay for education. So these are things that that inspired me. And so a part of what I learned throughout my journey as a globetrotter was, you know, giving back. When you travel around the world, you get to see things from a different perspective, a pr perspective that's a lot different from your 3,000 uh, population town of Brinkley, Arkansas, you know, when you begin to travel to places, you know, such as Rome and Italy and Paris, you know, London over to China, and it, it has an impact on you, you know? So yeah, intention is having a purpose and, and making sure that you do everything that you can and surrounding yourself, uh, attaining the knowledge that you need and, you know, doing the research, doing the information and I mean, gathering the information and right now, Again, young people and even us adults, we have no excuses now because you can Google everything and find all the information that you need. It's true, right? The access is is uh, more readily available than ever before, seemingly, right? Right. Talk to me a little bit about this idea of kindness 
right? That you've, you've really embraced and used almost as a filter kind of through which to live, seemingly to live your life through this conversation already, but the previous one we had is, is this something that you've reflected upon? And at a certain point in your life, you identified like, yeah, this is it. This is my theme. Or is this something that even as a kid, you were told or taught about kindness? Where, where did that kind of come from? I think that it was something that was definitely instilled in me uh, as a kid. Again, my my grandparents, I was lucky enough to have my grandparents around, a host of aunts and uncles around to, uh, you know, help help raise me. And my grandmother on my mother's side, she was really impactful in the sense that she, I just remember as a young, young boy walking around the different older people's houses that she would go and check on them and make sure they had food and, you know, things like this for no particular reason. I don't think she was getting paid to do these things. And she was really heavily involved in the church as well. So she used to uh, you know, take me on a lot of the trips that she would go on with the revival services and tent revivals and things like that. So I would, you know, see preachers in front of hosts of people, you know, s- spreading hope. And with me, it was something that, you know, kind of inspired me. Not that I'm a, a, a pastor or a preacher or anything like that, but just knowing the impact uh, that I could have on people by spreading something that's positive uh, is, is something that instilled in me today. It led to me eventually in college taking public speaking. It led to me probably extended my career as a globe charter from where it probably would be a normal to three to five year uh, career into an 18 year career because I was able to get, and I'm still capable of course, which I do get in front of large groups of people and and spread hope and, and positivity and the message of kindness. And that's been kind of the, the, the song and story of my life. Everything that's happened monumental pretty much in my life has been a result of someone being kind enough to stand up and believe in me. And these are the stories that I share uh, with the groups of people that I talk to, you know, the, the the schools, the the universities, and the businesses. Yeah. Wow. Talk to me about the three to five year life of a globe trotter, making it eighteen. That that that's pretty significant. How does how does how does someone do that? Well, <clears throat> coming in to the globe charters back in nineteen ninety nine, I mean, my my nickname was Flight Time, so I was known for my uh, my leaping ability. But one of the things that I learned early on was that if you wanted to have a, a longer career, you had to pick on up on other things. You had to, uh, I had to become a dribbler, which uh, was what Curly Neal, which who a lot of people know, the legendary Curly Neal, he was a guy who slid on the floor and, and dribbled around. I had to become what we call a, an advanced ambassador. And that's the person that could go into the schools and speak in front of uh, large groups of people. Uh, the person who could go into the, the hospitals and, and the businesses and even sit down in some of the business meetings and and try to make sure that certain partnerships and sponsorships go through. So the the first part is actually being able to play basketball and and all of that. But there's other things that will extend your career. If I just came in as flight time with my leaping ability, uh, eventually that leaping ability doesn't last as long. But if I'm able to do other things within the organization, I think that's with any other job. You know, you want to make yourself as valuable as you can, and that that what will extend your year from your career from three to five to you know, 10 to 15, or even maybe 15 to, uh, you know, 20. You know, those last couple of years for myself, I was a player and coach at the same time. So I did a dual role. Yeah, that is fascinating. And and also during that that tenure, Joe, I mean, this this contract that I signed, I signed 17 one-year contracts and one two-year contracts. So every year, uh, your job is on the line. So you had to be wow, ready to Wow, talk about pressure. Uh, yeah, every year. Okay. Wow. So how'd you get that two year? That sounds pretty, pretty unique then if you got a two year contract. What happened there? Well, I think it was probably midway through my career and they knew that they wanted to at least keep me for another couple of years. And they, they <laughs> the salary kind of kept going up. So we just kind of kept it the same for a couple of years. And I mean, for me, it was pretty cool to know that I had a two year uh, contract as opposed to that one year. But one of the things about that is that when you get that, you have to still remain consistent in, in who you are and continue to be productive. I can't be comfortable. So. No, because no, no. Went, they, they, they did go back to the one years after that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was a little, little too risky for them, it sounds like. Right, right. So what is one change in habit that has had an exponential payoff? You referenced once you moved to California, your eating habits. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I would say uh, certainly my eating habits, uh, they changed. Uh, living in Shreveport, Louisiana. I mean, you have a lot of 
good Cajun food, good Southern cooking, fried food. And I mean, even growing up in Arkansas, that was a lot of what I, you know, ate growing up. But it seemed like even on the road, it was a little bit difficult at times over the course of 18 years to eat properly all the time, because sometimes you'd get back, you know, to the hotels and there wouldn't be, you know, proper food where you could, you know, that would be healthy for you. So you end up eating a lot of, you know, hamburgers sometimes, and you may get a salad here and there. But, you know, it, it's something that, at that time when you're playing every single day, it doesn't really affect your body as much. So you can kind of maintain the weight, but when you go back home and you're not on the bus every day or pulling your luggage off of the bus or, you know, walking up to a different hotel room each and every night, you're probably not as active. So you get mixed that with, you know, good fried food and, and Cajun food, you, you know, you begin to put on weight. So for me, when my career ended actually in 2017, a few months after that, I moved out to California and, one of the things I noticed was there were more healthy food options available than there were down there in Treeport, where I was living at for almost uh, 25 years. And so I just began to eat a little bit different, and I began to notice a, a difference in my weight. I began to do things like meditate, which I'd never done before. I started to hike. Um, I started to ski. So just experiencing new things along with just not saying that I don't eat hamburgers and things like that, but I also make sure that I do uh, the things I need to do physically as far as working out and, and watching what I'm eating and making sure those are the things I'm consuming each and every day. So, yeah, that's one of the habits that I'm certainly glad that I changed, you know, was my eating habits. Yeah. Yeah. That makes and, sense. Although and, if I'm, go ahead. I was going to say, and from that, again, when I, when I retired in 2017, I was about 225. And now the weight that I'm at now is about 195 to 200. This is the the way that I was at in college in my early globe charter days. So it's definitely had a significant impact. It sounds like it. Yeah. I was going to say there's just as much access to the less healthy types of foods as well, right? Where you're well, yeah. at now, you can, you can get them just as easily, I imagine. Well, well, yeah, you can certainly get them just as easy. But, you know, when you're driving up and down the, you know, the highway or the four lane or the interstate, when you look over there, again, there's, healthier options even on the menu as far as like vegan and gluten-free and uh yeah there's 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 different options for sure and i've traveled to all 50 states around the united states and there's a difference in every uh, demographic of the united states every section as far as the types of food that are served which is pretty cool that is cool yeah speaking of travel i imagine there's lots of places where you can access drugs and alcohol right that is something you've said no to that has made a significant impact in your life. Tell me about that. Well, you know, growing up as a, a young boy in small town Arkansas, believe it or not, there were access to, you know, things such as, you know, marijuana and alcohol. But sure. for me, you know, knowing that my intention was to go beyond that. One of the things that my high school basketball coach used to tell me in high school, he used to say, you know, if you start doing that stuff now, what are you going to? What are you going to do when you get old enough to actually do it, to have a drink? You don't already have experienced it. So for me, that was something that kind of uh, locked in. And so hmm. I think that if I had not had that wisdom, you know, as a, as a young boy, it could have easily led me down a different path because I was around people who, you know, drank and, and smoke and, and did sure. these things. But I knew in my mind that if I had decided to do those things at the, that point, the outcome, the intention that I had, you know, for my life, wouldn't have come to pass. So yeah, it definitely had a significant, significant impact. And then you chose to continue to not drink. Is that, is that how that played out or you hit oh, 21? No. I, and, okay. well, I mean, 21 years old, I'm old enough to, to drink. And so, I mean, of course on the road, sometimes after a game, we go out and have drinks and celebrate and, you know, sure. I'm, I'm old enough now, you know, to do that. And that's something that I definitely don't do as much as I did when I was traveling around the world, which is another, a habit that I'm glad that I've been able to break. And this probably helped me lose some weight as well. But my wife and I, we certainly enjoy uh, a glass of wine every now and then. As I mentioned to you, we recently celebrated our first anniversary and went down to uh, Napa for some wine tasting and dinner for the day. Yeah, that's fabulous. Not that one can't go to Napa and not drink, but it just seems like a very different experience. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, the landscape and the vineyards, and they have other things that you can do there at right. Napa, of course. Yeah. What area in your life feels just about perfect? Well, to be honest with you, uh, Joe, 
nothing ever really seems perfect to me because I continue to imagine, you know, I continue to dream. And as long as I'm continuing to imagine and dream, things will never be perfect until I accomplish them. But one of the things that in my life is that once one accomplishment happens, doesn't mean that you get to forget about the other things that you dream about. You know, as a young boy, again, I mentioned to you that I had the intentions to become a professional athlete. I wanted to go to college. And these are things that happen. But also, as a young boy, I had imaginations of being an entertainer or being on television. And these things happened during my career as a globe charter. But even after that, now post globe charting, I still get to dream about these things. I still get to, based on my experiences that I had on the amazing race and, you know, being on The Price is Right and having an appearance on The Bachelor and Cup, like all these different experiences are things that I enjoyed. And so even now, since I've retired, I continue to uh, explore these different uh, avenues as an actor right now in a movie that's coming out April 14th. Uh, called Sweetwater that's coming out in theaters everywhere. And even a documentary that I'm uh, working on right now that I'm hoping to get produced here in the next year, I'm still continuing to to explore those dreams that I had as a young boy. Although I can't run up and down the court and dunk a basketball the way that I used to, I can still continue to move around, be healthy, and at the same time, explore the dreams that I had as a young boy. Wow. So it sounds like when when the idea of perfection to you is something that is done or complete. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I would certainly say that's a, I would certainly say something that is done or complete. And I don't think that I mean, in this life, nothing's ever really done or complete. Oh, you're not until, done. Not from what right. I can hear so far. You're not done. It's it's right. just we, what's next. What can I do have next? To, we have to continue to, you know, continue to evolve. I mean, again, it, it is. It's what's next. You have to try different things. Uh, some of the things that I've even done since leaving the Globe Charters, I've driven lift. I've done leadership school. I've done DoorDash. I've, you know, given TED Talks. I've sold insurance. You know, I've acted. I've written a book. I've co-authored. Like, there are so many things that we, you know, we can do. I've, you know, uh, branded myself Swagball. I'm, you know, kindness is free. And so, I mean, there are so many things uh, that we get to do. We have to continue to learn and continue to explore until we find you know, whatever it, whatever it is that gets us up every day and gets us excited. And that could be a combination of things. And for me, that is a combination of things just from trying and exploring other, different other things. What do you think it is that motivates you to say, to stay so passionate and driven? What motivates me? I would say early on, the thing that motivated me was I wanted to make my mom proud. I wanted to make my mother proud. She was a young mother. She had six of us again by the time she was uh, 25, 26 years old. And I saw her struggle. I saw her provide for us and sometimes alone as a single mother, uh, just make magic out of nothing. And for me, at a young age, you know, around ninth grade, I was really inspired to make good grades because I wanted, uh, you know, to go to college and I knew she couldn't afford to pay. I wanted to you know, her to be able to op open up the newspapers or turn on the TV and sometimes see me there because I knew these things that these are things that made her proud. And that was early on. That was the thing that, you know, that that inspired me. And as I got a little bit older and started to have kids, now I have two kids and that playing with the Globe Trotters, they were my inspiration. You know, when I'm working out in the gym or when I'm running at three to four miles or when I don't feel like getting up sometimes during those days, I would think about them and they would be the the reason why I'm able to overcome, you know, the the mindset of of not being able to complete something, not being able to do something. So uh, it, it changes over time. And again, now it's still my kids, but it's also my wife. You know, I'm newly mm -hmm. married. So it's that, you know, she inspires me. That's great. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Of course. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah. So this transitions nicely. Who is someone you admire? And what do you admire about them? Well, yeah, I mean, my wife, I mean, I, I admire her. Me being a, a health and physical education major, uh, you know, graduating in 98, I never taught uh, in the schools other than my student teaching. My wife, she is not a health and physical education major. I'm pretty sure she has a degree in accounting, but she is one of the the reasons why, you know, I'm even more educated on some of the things that I put in my body and how important it is to, you know, really have a good routine of meditating. And, you know, every now and then you get to have a cheat day, but just 
she knows everything it seems like about what's bad and what's good as far as putting in your body. But at the same time, also, she inspires me because of the way that she uh, she goes about her business. You know, she uh, she runs a couple of uh, tax businesses. She, you know, does accounting on the side. I mean, she just does it all. She's a, a superwoman. And I admire it. Like even for myself, I used to always wonder before I got married what it would be like to have somebody just kind of got up every day and worked out. And we have this uh, tonal machine that re really enjoy doing. And sometimes I make it out of the bed a little bit later, but to hear her and her working out, it's like, man, how can I not, how can I not get up and work out That's when great. my wife is in Yeah, there, some healthy know, competition, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, she inspires me and I'm sure I sure hope that I inspire her in some of the same ways, but yeah, that's my inspiration. That's great. That's really great. So yeah, again, you, you kind of transitioned into this as well. What do you imagine some people admire about you? Well, I think that, I mean, even dating back to coming from a small town, you know, being able to go and play division one basketball, being able to graduate with honors and being able to represent even my college on a, a, a national television level is something that I think I know that some people still admire those things, you know, being able to accomplish those things and then being able to take that to a professional career with the Globe Charters and being able to just do more than than make the team, because I've always kind of been a person who wanted to go above and beyond. I didn't just want to uh, go to college and play basketball. I wanted to be great in college. You know, some people will say I was great. Some people say I was pretty good, but I had a pretty good career that led to some great opportunities which led to me traveling to you know 90 different countries around the world and i know that people that that, that know me have been inspired because they you know shared with me uh how i inspired them you know during their journey so i think in those ways and even now uh <clears throat> being a former globe charter who started you know a group a facebook group of guys reconnecting and now having about 250 people who were past and present during the organization in that group and now having a movie come out uh, involving myself and one of my former Globe Charters telling the story of a guy who broke the the color line in, in the NBA, Sweetwater Clifton. You know, he was a former Globe Charter who acted like myself, who was born and raised in Arkansas until, you know, early on moving to Chicago. But just breaking that line and being a Globe Charter to plan in the NBA, you know, his life was amazing. And to be a part of that, that project, I know that guys in there are inspired and even with me being a part of that project, I just really, really hope and, and I, I know I know that more of my former teammates are going to get more of these opportunities, opportunities to shine because there's a lot of guys out there with a lot of talent. I would say some of them are, of course, more talented than I am, but not getting. No, no, no. Don't you dare. Don't say that. No, no, no. <laughs> but but I certainly but again, really, I just want them to you know be able to shine the way that I've been able to shine and get some of the opportunities I've been able to have. Uh, during the course of my life. And I wanted to continue to, you know, explore and create more opportunities for myself as well. That's, that's great. All right. Now I'm curious, what do you do when you're not feeling on when you look, you, you've set some really high bars, right? And it's exciting. And I mm -hmm. want to hear more, frankly, but what happens when you're, when you hit a slump, especially when you know what you're capable of, you're, you're capable of so much. You've done so many amazing things in different realms uh, in so many different decades. Right. What do you, what is, what does Herb Lang do when he's feeling low? And I'm glad you asked that question because there was, there were times when I didn't, I really didn't know what to do. And I think that I learned a little bit more about myself once my, uh, my globe trotter career was, was over with. Um, I became again, I think a more more intentional because I had to refocus. You know, I had to, I had to shift. And one of the things that I've been, a couple of the things that I've been able to add to, you know, my life since retiring and and being consistent with it is the ability to get up and I meditate every morning. You know, 10, 15 minutes. After that, I read. You know, I read for even if it's just for. For five minutes, if it's something, it's usually something positive. And after that meditation, it it leads into a workout or a walk. And just having those three or four things to look forward to every single day, even on days when I would prefer to be busy, busier, 
just knowing how fortunate uh, you know that I am to be able to get up and do those things, uh, they get me going each and every day. And if it were not for those things, sometimes I don't know how I'd be able to make it because, like you said, there are days, of course, when I don't have it. You know, there are days when I don't feel like getting up. There are days when things seem like they aren't going, uh, ever going. You know, the way that you seem, and mm-hmm. it seems like they come in in streaks at times, but. One of the things that I do realize is how fortunate and how blessed we are to actually be here each and every day. And I'll share this with you, too, uh, that I didn't share. I, I learned this when one of the things that I did was I worked in the uh, the funeral home business for a little bit uh, in college and in high school. Right. Of course you did. And, then, yeah. and, and in, uh, in high school and in college. And one of the things that I learned was the importance of being grateful for each and every day. Because working in that business, you would see people, um, you know, at the uh, at the uh, funerals and, you know, see them crying and you see the, you know, the regret that they had and the, the wishing that they, you know, had another day with these people. So for me, being able to reflect on these moments and even now losing people uh, throughout life, just realizing how fortunate I am each and every day and giving thanks each and every day for being able to get up. That's what gets me over it. But I mean. We have those days, but also at the same time, I have way more good do- days than the bad days. Yeah, and that yeah. and that's that's the beautiful thing about it, too. And realizing that something simple is even like walking today, just walking and putting a smile on your face for no reason. It can change your, your whole mood. You know, it can inspire you in a way that you can't even imagine or even doing something nice to somebody or waving, you know, hello to somebody. I was yeah. walking last week and. You know, I'm I'm a big component of, of kindness. And there was a, a family of three uh, riding their bikes. There was two sons and a, and a mother. And these young boys are probably about 10 feet apart. And one of them, he complimented to me. He was like, hello, nice shirt. You know, like, thank you for no reason. Then the second one on cue, I'm walking my dog. He's like, oh, man, that's a cute dog you got there. You know, again, thank you so much. And then the mom was like, hey, hello, hope you're having a great day. So it's it's something that that I think that's within those people, but it's something that that's something simple that makes a difference. Just being yeah. intent. They intended to make sure that I was having a good day or do something complimentary to make me feel good. And that's what it's all about. That's great. That's great. And, and thank you for sharing that uh, other experience that of, of the, the work you did at, at, for funeral services. That to me would be such a unique perspective, right? Of On gratitude. Yeah. Because it's, look, it's, it's one thing to know to be grateful, but when you're feeling low, that's not the, typically the first feeling that you're feeling is grateful, is gratitude, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a nice, it's a nice thing to feel, but to have the perspective, I imagine, and maybe that's not the only reason, but I imagine that's a very real direct experience that taps you into that feeling of gratitude. Like it could be loss, regret. Like you witnessed it firsthand. I imagine that's that stuck with you for a while. It's certainly something that that leaves an impression on you again. I mean, and just things aren't always going to go perfect. I mean, I've had plenty of, uh, you know, setbacks in my life, even early on, you know, starting out, I tell people I was like Forrest Gump. I was bow legged. I had to wear the leg braces You know, I had to overcome that. And then it became a height thing, you know, from. 11th grade through 12th to 12th grade, I grew from five, seven to six, three, you know, before that I was struggling. I was the best basketball player, but I wasn't as, as productive as I was once I became, you know, a little bit taller and even, you know, coming into college and not being able to play my first year, that was tough, you know, sitting on the bench when I've been used to playing all that time. And then, you know, coming to the globe charters, which was a blessing, but still not really understanding what my role was uh immediately and, and you know figuring that out and then that coming to an end at some point and trying to figure out what's next these are things that happen throughout the course of life but we get to figure out that and, and in me i understand if i did it once i can do it again and we're gifted in so many ways and again like i said we just go out and explore different things until we figure out what it is and my intention is you know to make the world a better place in my way in the same way that i did for 18 years with the globe trotters and that's through you know speaking you know that's through leading groups of men and women, uh, creating opportunities and, and spreading kindness. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Can you take me 
a little bit into what your meditation practice is like. So I know lots of people ask me, they want to start meditating, they want to get into it. What what's what's your practice look like, if you don't mind sharing? Well, for me, it started out, I was I downloaded this app called uh Headspace. It was a little bit right before COVID. And I had never really meditated seriously before that. Um before that I had only meditated really at this leadership conference that I um, had went to for like three months. It was over the course of three months. Uh, that's when I really realized the power of it. But <clears throat> when COVID happened and all the stress came in and these new apps and stuff started, you know, I had on my phone already, I began to, you know, try them. And so started walking and I listened to the walk meditation. And then I did that for about a year. And actually for the last couple of years, it's more of a, uh, you know, of a, a dark room. I prefer, you know, first thing in the morning. And it's simple. I'll get something off of off of YouTube or I'll Google meditation for the morning. And I just let them play 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes. Uh, nobody's in the room with me. And what happens during those meditations, they really help me kind of figure out my day. You know, I already have a little idea of what my day looks like, but they really, really help me uh, to lock in on my day, who I need to contact. Uh, what What do I want to accomplish today? How many, you know, emails do I need to send out? You know, who do I that I, you know, reached out to me the day before that I didn't get back to. And it sets the, sets the mood for my day. And then the walk, you know, allows me to help get the blood flowing, you know, the, the, the movement. And then after that, sometimes it's a workout and then it's, Hey, let's go. It's time to roll. The blood is already, you know, already flowing and you know, <laughs> that's it. That's, that's great. That's, yeah. And that's, that's, that's a daily routine for you. Yeah. For, for me, that is a, a daily routine. I mean, except of course, the days my wife and I, you know, we go and, and spend the time together. But still, even uh, before that, I still try to make sure that I get up and meditate and walk at mm -hmm. least every single day, even if I have to get up a little bit earlier. Yeah. And as but, we talked about before, you, you you don't sit still too often. You you split your time. You're you're traveling with work and, and and personal things. So but these things seem accessible to you regardless of where you are. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the cool things about, you know, what I do as a, you know, as a motivational speaker, or I guess as a uh, work from at home, you know, kind of person that's that, you know, my wife and I, we live in Sacramento, California, you know, four or five months out of the year. And then we down in Florida, uh, the other seven to eight months out of the year. So, you know, just being able to live in different places and, and spread kindness in different places is one of the things I really enjoy. You know, I've been able to have couple of basketball clinics down there in Florida, a couple of, in Arkansas since post COVID. And, you know, these are things that, that bring me joy being able to go into the different schools and uh, having the opportunity to do a Ted talk uh, even last year. I mean, it's just a blessing. It's something that really fills me up, you know, to be able to go into to groups and, and be able to share my experiences and inspire, uh, inspire people young and old, you know, that's what, so we used to say when I played with the Globe Trials, we were able to inspire people from one to 99. <laughs> Love it. No, that's great. And I imagine your message isn't all that different when you're delivering it to age one versus age 99, right? You talk to different age groups. Uh, I imagine there's pretty common examples that, that, are, uh, that are true for everyone, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's one of the cool things. That I, that I share, I have, we all have ha had experiences. I have experiences now for 45 years, 46 years. And when I go in and speak to a group of elementary kids, you know, I share experiences from when I was that age and my mindset, and that's way that they're able to kind of connect with you. Uh, when, when you're speaking to a middle school group, of course, we had at middle school experiences, we're getting ready for high school. What did that feel like? What was my mindset? How did I go into it? And then, you know, leaving high school, going into college or preparing for high school, coming out. There's just so many things that we've been able to experience. And if we actually think about them, there are so many things that we can share with younger people that will help them, you know, overcome some of the hurdles or obstacles that we may have shared. And these things continue to evolve over the course of our lives, you know. So that's how I, you know, kind of fill the room. If I'm speaking to a group, I'll kind of, you know, get a feel of what their intention intentions are what would they like to go you know get across and i'll sprinkle a little bit of kindness in there with it mm -hmm. yeah i'm sure i'm sure you don't leave that out anywhere <laughs> you go i get that sense that you're you're always bringing that with you it's free kindness is free it doesn't cost anything joe give it away with abundance knowing that you'll never run out of it i love it i love it 
Herb, is there anything else we haven't dug into that you'd like to talk about, you'd like to share, or any other ideas you'd like to talk about? Oh, man, any other ideas? Well, I mean, of course, my motto is, is kindness is free. And in all levels of my life, it's really, really impacted me and made a difference. And when when I think about kindness and the people that have really impacted me, I think about how proud they were and how accomplished they felt in seeing me be able to do some of the things that I've been able to do, knowing that they had a, a result, a direct hand in it. So anybody that's listening out there, if there is some young person or some uh, friend or former classmate that may need a little bit of kindness right now, they may need a, a little bit of a helping hand, just realize if you have that power right now, you could really, really make a big, big impact on someone's life. So and it doesn't have to be financially. It could just be a telephone call. It could be, you know, having lunch with someone or, or it could be either or, but just take time out to help that person and, and figure out what they may be going through. If you imagine that they are, even if they're not just ask questions, but just, you know, be that helping hand and you never know what could happen. You could, uh, you know, have someone turn out to travel to 90 different countries around the world, meet presidents and popes and, and inspire kindness in all those different places around the world at the same time. So just be an inspiration to others. And that's kind of how I live my life. And uh, I feel like the new generation and the new way of the world is leading with, with leadership, uh, is leading with kindness and in love. And so let's uh, treat people better than we can even expect to be treated. And, and that's what it's all about. That's awesome. I'm hearing some some real optimism from you then as far as the way forward for Oh yeah, mankind, humankind. Of, of course. I mean, I feel like I've been here in this world. I've been able to witness some some pretty interesting things, but at the same time, I've been able to witness some amazing things, and I'm so grateful for those amazing things that I have been able to to witness. I have gratitude for all the experiences because they make me appreciate uh, the really, really great experiences as well, and we learn from everything. Yeah, I love it. Herb, I want to thank you again. This has been phenomenal. I, I love hearing about all these experiences and just the, the resolve you have around kindness, around your approach, around your uh, zest, but your enthusiasm for life and just doing good and, and having fun. I hear a lot of fun in your life too. And you got a lot of fun projects you're working on now and just the optimism you have. I've really enjoyed our time and I really appreciate your careful consideration of, of all these, these questions. Well, I, I definitely appreciate it. I've, I've had a lot of fun. And again, I mean, if there's anybody that's interested in possibly having me come out and, you know, have an experience with your group or groups, definitely reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn as the motivational speaker speaker or Herbert Lang. Uh, also, you, of course, you can find me on Twitter uh, or Instagram under at D.A. Trotter for it. That's D-A-T-R-O-T-T-E-R for I mean, a lot of people are on those social media networks now. So, yeah, I'd love an opportunity to come in and share with you guys. Uh, my message of kindness. Again, I can cater that message around to whatever you guys want to emphasize. And one of the cool things I also do, Joe, as well, when I go into different speaking events is uh, I present out a kindness. is A kindness is free award. So uh, in that business or that school, if there's somebody that they want to recognize, we definitely give them that opportunity. Because for me growing up, I was recognized for my athletic ability and making good grades. But there was a lot of people who were just simply nice uh, that played a major role throughout my high school that, you know, helped me, you know, get to where I am. So I just want to recognize those people. I love that. That's great. Cool. And and for sure, we'll have links to uh, all your socials and, and the many projects you're engaged with now. So people can take a look if they haven't already Googled you by now. I'm sure they have at this point in the conversation, but uh, <laughs> no, we'll be sure to share that with everyone. Thanks I appreciate again. it. Really all appreciate right, your you. time. Kindness is free. Spread the word. This has been Intentionally Ever After, hosted by intentional lifestyle coach, Joe Bukartek. If you would like to have your own intentional conversation with Joe on or off the air, visit intentionallyeverafter.com. Thanks for listening.